In the city of Jerusalem, whispers of anticipation are heard everywhere. The streets are alive with the news of the imminent arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus sends two of his disciples to fetch a donkey and its colt. He rides into Jerusalem, fulfilling what was foretold by the prophet Zechariah. As Jesus enters the city, a large crowd gathers to greet him, spreading their cloaks and palm branches on the road in a display of honor and reverence. The atmosphere is one of celebration. This is Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, the embodiment of hope and salvation for a weary world. The people cheer. They shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And whether they know it or not, as Jesus passes by them, they are witnessing the face of God in the humanity of this man on this borrowed donkey. This Easter, you're invited to discover the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to experience the overwhelming gift of grace and salvation that's being offered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The children are dismissed to Children's Church. Thank you for watching that short video. And I remembered what I wanted to say. All I had to do was look down at my notes, and it was wrote down. <laughs> Anyways, I just wanted to announce that there are some free books outside of the entrance here. I'm um, on a table there, a white table. I have cases of these books, so please do not be shy. Grab one, grab two, grab a handful. We did hand out some of these books a couple years ago, and I heard some people talk about how magnificent it was. And I'd love you to take one, take a few. If you haven't read it, read it. If you have read it, feel free to take some and hand them out to people this Easter Sunday season where people are even more at this season open to hearing about Christ and the impact he's made on all humanity for all time. Chuck also had a wonderful book study yesterday on the four chairs of discipleship of which I'd encourage all of you to talk to Chuck about later. It's a great discipleship idea and something to put into practice. And then finally... This is the big announcement that I wrote down. I want to thank um, somebody this week, unnamed. I don't want to name him because I think that's how he would want it. But this week, somebody made this for me. And I want to bring special attention to somebody else because ever since I came here to preach, I have loved the top of this, of this lecture and this podium here because in it is engraved very beautifully, 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Be prepared in season, out of season. Also, ever since I started here, I've talked about how I love this podium. It's a po perfect height, perfect angle. It's, it's so meaningful. But I do wish it had a place to put my bottle of water, a Bible, and some stuff. So this week, somebody actually hand-built this for me. And knowing how much this top meant to me, they also transferred this top from the old one to the new one. So thank you for putting that extra effort in there, and thank you to the one who made this originally also. It means a lot to me. I know it has meant a lot to Eldon too. With that said, let's get into the message for today. Please open your Bibles to Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Matthew 21. Today is an important and significant day for our faith as Christians. And we're going to be reading about this. We're going to be talking about this. Why is this day so important? Because this is Palm Sunday. And this Palm Sunday marks the beginning of the Holy Week, the Passion Week, the final week of Lent, of where we recognize Jesus triumphantly entering into Jerusalem, of which kicks off a week in which he was greatly tested. He was arrested. He was convicted. He was crucified. And most importantly, most significantly, it did not end with that crucifixion. It did not end with his death. He resurrected victoriously successful. Now, knowing all this, I want to say this, though, because I think so often we talk about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But what we don't talk about is that he wasn't just triumphantly entering. He was courageously entering. Yes, Jesus courageously entered Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, courageously. Why do I say this? 
Because listen what I just said. When he triumphantly entered, courageously entered now we say, it's significant. Because all that would come in this final week, the betrayal, the arrest, the denial, the crucifixion, the great torture and pain, his best friends, his disciples, his followers, all leaving him and, and mocking him. All this would lead not just to crucifixion, not just to resurrection, but to our salvation. Jesus courageously entered because he knew what was to come. And he came anyways. He came forward. Let's talk about this final week of our courageous king. And that's what he is, a courageous king. Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt. He then washes his disciples' feet. Here the master, again, knowing what is coming his way. He foretold this to his disciples, to his followers. He knew what was coming. But he gets down on his hands and knees. He still serves. The master becomes the server. But then a close friend, a disciple, betrays him. He spits on him. Jesus is abandoned. He's denied. He's beaten. He's abused. He's whipped. He's flogged. He's tried. He's convicted of being the king of Jews. They put him on a, on a trial, and here they had this man beside him, which was guilty, a murderer. And they said, release him, because we want Jesus to hang this is what Jesus is triumphantly coming in town for. Courageously coming in town for. And finally, he's crucified, hung upon a cross-shaped tree, suffering horrifically. He's killed and buried. But it does not end there, praise the Lord. And I hope you come back on Good Friday and Easter Sunday to hear the whole story. But we're still going to talk about the story today. Jesus is a courageous king, for he entered Jerusalem to do all this for our redemption. For our redemption. And let me tell you again, he knew what was to come. I love this picture behind me, and it's not accurate, but it still gives us some examples of what things might have looked like. Jesus is walking into Jerusalem, walking with people following, walking with people there proclaiming. Now, I believe there wouldn't have just been like 50 people there. There would have been thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Some say it could have been in the millions because of the Passover time. And what are they doing? They're throwing their cloaks down. They're grabbing palm branches, waving them there and throwing them down before him, proclaiming, Hosanna. Jesus is riding into his death. Yet they're proclaiming, save us. It's powerful, and I better get back to my notes, but it is still powerful to see him riding forward. He goes forward to do what we needed him to do. You see, through him coming forward, we would be greatly blessed, and we're still blessed today. Why did he do all this? I mean, we didn't deserve this, but because John 3, 17 reminds us, he came into a world not for condemnation, but for its salvation. Let's read. If you have your Bibles open there before you, Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 11. Matthew, oh, sorry, 21, 1 through 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. I love that. Man, after preaching on this for 10 years, there's so much extra insight I want to give, but I can't give it all. But I do just want to say that I love it how I don't think anything else was needed to be said here. I think any one of us, if we saw somebody walking out to our garage, hopping in our, in our car um, for purpose of animal usage, I'll say our Ford Bronco. I don't have a Bronco, but, but we saw them walking up to our Bronco, taking it out of the garage and about to take it. And we say, what are you doing? And somebody just said, well, the Lord needs them. We'd be like, what? <laughs> the Lord needs them. And notice what happened. He will send them at once. You see, this was foretold. 
People knew what was happening around them, even if they didn't fully understand it. This was a prepared way. Let's read on. The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. You see, what he said would happen, happened. They have the animals here. And he sat on them. Verse 8 now, if you're following along. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and the fo- the, that followed him were shouting. So notice there's two groups of crowds here. You have the crowd that goes before them, him and the crowd that was already following him because Jesus had just done a miraculous event He had done many miraculous events, but Lazarus was just raised from the dead. And I fully believe there were thousands of people already following him. They knew something big was happening before their very eyes. The crowds went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? Can you imagine Jesus entering our city and people screaming out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. Someday that will be happening all across the world. It'll be undeniable what's happening someday. And someday it will be too late. I pray that we all proclaim this to the world in the here and now. But look what they said. This is a prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. As I think of people... The thousands, the hundreds of thousands yelling out Hosanna. I can also think of thousands of other people coming forward and saying, what is the commotion? What is going on? And we better have an answer for them. Because look at the answer they gave. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. It's not very correct, is it? Let's read forward. Or let's speak forward. I better stick to my notes. As we begin our story, we see Jesus approaching Jerusalem. He, before he enters, he sends his disciples, we cover this, to go get a donkey and its colt. And he rides into town on this donkey's colt. The disciples do what they, they are told. And Jesus does what is foretold. He fulfills this prophecy. In fact, the text also says in Zechariah 21.5, that he would be gentle and riding on a donkey. It was very important that he wasn't riding in here on a horse. Not yet. He's riding on a donkey. And there's two things I want you to see with this. First, I want you to see this. Even though he's on a donkey, Jesus has all the authority. Jesus has all the authority. In fact, riding in on a donkey, although it symbolizes or signifies peace coming to a city, it also shows authority. Kings rode into towns in very similar manners. In the ancient world, if a king rode into town on a horse, he intended to wage war. In fact, his sword would probably be drawn and he'd probably have have hundreds or thousands of other soldiers behind him riding alongside. But here, that's not what we see. We see another image which did happen with kings riding into town. He rode into town on a donkey, indicating peace. Jesus rode in on a donkey to demonstrate the type of kingship he was coming to deliver. A sacrificial love which would bring peace to all humanity. Zechariah 9.10 further proclaims, I will take the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. There's so much prophecy in the fulfilling of it in Scripture. In fact, it's said, and it's been studied by greater men than I, more wiser men than I, that Jesus fulfilled over a thousand different prophecies through his life and ministry. Jesus is the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God, the King coming into town. But you don't see him coming in to wage war against people, slashing 
slashing them down with his sword is quite the opposite. He comes in on a donkey, symbolizing peace, symbolizing I'm here to save you. And although they recognize that waving the branches and then proclaiming Hosanna, they saw a different type of king. You see, he is proclaiming that he is here in the war. The war is about to be over. Sin's bondage will be broken, for Jesus has the power to save through raising people from the dead. Look at Lazarus. However, all this to say, I don't think the disciples fully knew what was to happen, just as we don't fully know exactly what's to happen in the future. The Gospel of John says in John 12, 16, At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. The second thing I want you to see here is this. Jesus proclaims his kingship in this. And we've already been speaking of this, but let's go a little further. Jesus proclaims his kingship over all things while riding in on this donkey. And this is no small thing. The, the crowds declare Jesus to be, remember, the prophet from Nazareth. Yet that's not what Jesus is claiming himself to be in this act or even before, as he talked about what he was to bring to the world. In fact, even the crowds, although some said he's a prophet, the crowd's actions don't show merely a prophet. Palm branches, cloaks spread. That must be one really good prophet to put your cloaks down on the ground and camel dirt and everything else. He is more than a teacher, more than a prophet. He was and is the king, and the king enters courageously then, and the king enters courageously today in our lives still. Let's move forward here. During his life and ministry, we see his kingship. We see his authority. We see Jesus had and still has all authority over nature, over demons, over sickness, over death, and over health. We see that he spoke with authority and was not just someone who knew the right things to say. He knew because he's the one that created the right way to live. We see that he protected people from storms, from the waves, from the wind and the sea. We see that he, he saved people from death and disease and led people to good health. We see that he healed people from blindness, from mutinous. We see that he healed leprosy and fevers and great bleeding. And we see that he cast out and freed people from evil spirits and diseases. Jesus is king. Just as God spoke the cosmos into existence in Genesis, everything under Jesus' authority here must comply and still comply. For Jesus was at creation with the Father and is equal and one with the Father. All things were created with the word and he is powerfully in charge. Let's move forward with this. When you think of the old creeds of the early Christian people, there's a creed which states, Jesus is Lord. The early Christians understood this. But I think that we often struggle with this statement. We say Jesus is Lord. We sing Jesus is Lord. But do you truly welcome the courageous King Jesus courageously, humbly into your life as a king? Because when we say Jesus is Lord, what it very much means, what they meant in their creed saying Jesus is Lord, is absolute authority. Do we recognize that Jesus has the authority over the world today? Absolute authority. Do we realize that Jesus still has absolute authority over salvation of souls? And if so, why don't we talk about it? Why don't we preach it from the rooftops per se? Jesus still has absolute authority over all nature and over all things. But more than that, he has absolute authority, or he should, over our lives. Is he the absolute authority for you? Because he is Lord, whether you recognize it or not. And someday all will answer for our sins. But let me tell you this about this authority. In all his authority, we still see great love. Isn't that amazing? You see, they confessed Jesus as Lord and they were proclaiming his complete authority over all things. But as they said, did that, 
they also proclaimed his great love for all his creation. And that's including you and me and all people. God does not desire anyone to perish, but to have life. And that's why he sent Jesus not to, to, to condemn the world, but to save the world. And in the scriptures, we see Jesus continually, continually spending time saving his people, directing his people, caring for his people. He would eat with the tax collectors, with sinners. He would let the sinful woman wet his feet with her tears. He would be served, but then he would still lay down his life to serve. He touched the untouchables. He loved the oppressed, and he still loved the oppressors too. He went to the outcast, not just the religious, the religious and wealthy and popular people of the day. And again, why? Because John 3, 17 to 18 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. That's all we have to do. Believe in God's son as Lord. Allow him to have authority over all things. Believe that he can save you from whatever is going on in your life. Trust in him, follow him. He has a right way to live. And to breathe. His way is the only right way. Jesus used his authority courageously to save the world. And as we think about him courageously walking into Jerusalem, we know that he would triumph over all life, even though his life would be put down. It would raise again, and he would triumph over death and sin. All this to say, I have a great question for us. A great challenge. Jesus has all authority over all things, but are you allowing him to have authority over you? Jesus was courageous. Jesus is still courageous. How about you? Are you being courageous for him? Are you laying down your life for him? He is the author of your life, of all life. He is the redeemer, sustainer, the perfecter of peace. The mighty counselor, prince of peace, he is mighty to save. Do you trust him as Lord of all, as your Lord? And then are you preaching it to others? And I don't just mean have you accepted some creed, but are you truly living in that creed that you profess? Does Jesus have the full authority within your life? And then do you speak about it? Yes, Jesus is courageous, whether you recognize it or not. He is the courageous king over all creation. And we should also be courageously following him. Be his subject. As I think of Jesus being king, kings have subjects. And those subjects listen to their king. Now, in earthly kingdoms, we've seen where subjects often also revolt against their king. And you know what? We do that every day. But praise the Lord, we have a gracious and mighty king who still forgives and leads us forward to salvation and into his everlasting kingdom. Jesus was courageously in control. I want you to see that. Jesus was courageously in control. He spoke of what was to come and he came forward into what was to come. It was no surprise to him what was coming, but he still came forward anyways. Jesus had been planning his entrance he knew it was to come. He knew the timing was not perfect to some, but it was perfect for him. Do you think it was smart to walk into town with a target on his back, on his head, a great warrant for arrest, you could say, in the mid-daylight with hundreds of thousands of people there to, to be proclaimed or have proclaimed Hosanna? The Pharisees were watching, the Sadducees were watching, and where some would be saying, save me, save me, others would say, we want to kill him, and they would. But he comes forward. He knew he would be betrayed, denied, beaten, and killed, but he comes forward courageously. The Jewish leaders were already plotting to kill Jesus, and Jesus doesn't hide anymore. He comes forward because the time was right for him. The time was no longer near. The time is here. 
Still, he comes forward. Will you come forward for him? Will you ask others to come forward for him? See, Jesus courageously came forward to be the king that we needed. Despite how others, these hundreds of thousands of people, would deny him, would fall away, would mock him. Jesus came forward. And I see an example for our own way of living. Despite knowing people will mock us. Despite knowing we will be persecuted. Despite living that, yes, we may be ignored and and abandoned by even our closest friends and family. We too must go forward. Go forward with Christ. Be courageous like Christ. How are you living? Are you living courageously with Christ and God's purpose in mind, their glory, their ways? Let's be specific. If you're courageous, I wrote this down. If you're courageous, then you'll follow Jesus as his subject and with you being you him being your king. If you're courageously following after Christ, you'll do the right thing regardless of the consequence. You stand up for what is righteous. But then for that, you're explain why it's righteous. Give attention to God. You'll feel fear, but do it anyways. Notice that when I said you'll feel fear. You're still going to be fearful at times. But courageously, you'll still do what is right. What is right, you'll do it anyways. You will not stop at failure. You'll be successful at going to the nations with the gospel. You'll risk being criticized. But yet in all this, you'll seek God with your whole heart in all things, and you will find him. You'll pursue purpose, his purpose, over your own comforts. And all for God's glory. For all, all for God's glory. I think Jesus was being courageous as he triumphantly entered into Jerusalem. But I think that we also can be courageous like Jesus when we step forward, come forward like he does. Too many, of, too many of us are stopped in our fear. We're stopped in our anxieties. We're stopped by the fear of failure and rejection and criticism. When nothing in the Bible tells us to be stopped by these things. In fact, it tells us do not be ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power for salvation to all that believe. So I ask you to consider, and this is my final point today before we can to conclude. Who do you say... Jesus is. These people, they're saying Jesus is a lot of things in their actions and their chanting and their wavings of palm branches. They're saying Jesus is a prophet. Who do you say Jesus is? Are you laying your cloak down for him? Are you laying your, your life down for him? Are you waving palm branches and, and, and proclaiming, save us? Because we still need saving. Every day of our lives, we need God to save us and lead us out of our temptations. Who is Jesus to you? Is he your king? Is he your full authority of your life? Is he your power? Is he your savior? Is he Lord? Who is Jesus to you? You should ask yourself this. Really, ask yourself this. And then I think, do the people around you know who you know Jesus to be. Because the people fall all around us. Even Christians, even people who we think are are righteous and living for God's glory in all things, every day you see these people fall. Declare who Jesus is to you and remember it. Just this past week, I heard a story of someone who said that they were feeling called to the ministry. And when I was talking to to this about somebody within our church, their, their one statement was, Really? He's a Christian? Man, I hope nobody says that of us. This person is feeling called to ministry, and yet some of the close people within his life do not not even know he's a Christian. I pray that people know you are a Christian. And there's, there's things to be said on both sides. That person, too, we must be looking out for who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's bad enough not to be proclaiming it, but then also not supporting those who are. We're called to be in fellowship with one another, helping one another, encouraging one another, lifting one another up. 
Who is Jesus to you? Do people know who Jesus is to you? Are you living for Jesus as Lord with authority over all things? Scripture says here are the people, they spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road as Jesus entered. This was a reception reserved for a king, but they would still fall away. I pray that we would give Christ a reception reserved for a king every day of our lives. But I pray we would understand the right type of king he is, not just a political king, but a king who would lay his life down sacrificially, selfishly, for us to have life forever, to be forgiven from sin or have the possibility made possible. Remember, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved. In Matthew 21, 10, we see the people saying, who is this? I pray people would be asking us that. Do we pray that? Do we pray as we triumphantly, and I hope we do triumphantly walk with courage, I pray people would say, who is it that you're living for? Because you're living for something different than me and I need it. Matthew 21, 11 again says, the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I said earlier, I pray that we would know the right person to give the credit to. This is the son of God. And I live for him because he lived and died and raised from the dead for me. Jesus had great recognitions within his life. In John eleven twenty seven, 27, we hear Jesus' his friend Martha proclaiming, You are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. In Matthew 16, 16, we hear his disciple Peter proclaiming, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. God is not dead. He is the living God still today. And then finally, before we conclude, in John 4.42, we hear a large part at the very least of an entire town proclaiming after spending a few days with Jesus, we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Do we really know that Jesus is the Savior of the world? See him triumphantly entering into your life, courageously entering into your lives still today. And then think about this, and this is later in my conclusion, but I'm getting it to it now. Whose lives are you courageously entering with this good news? Whose lives are you courageously entering with this good news? As we think about who is Jesus to us, and as we think about helping others to understand who Jesus is, I have a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says this, Let us not say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher only. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Enough about what others think Jesus is. Who is Jesus to you? Because I tell you what scripture tells us he, he did. He triumphantly entered, courageously entered Jerusalem. And this is what we celebrate today. As people proclaimed, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. This was Jesus, the King, the Son of God, the Messiah coming in to save us. But not just as a political king over our, our oppressors of Rome or the Democratic Party today, or anything Russia or China or anything else might try and throw against us. This is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, who has salvation in mind to save us from our sins, from all unrighteousness, and to lead us into his kingdom forevermore. This is what Jesus triumphantly, courageously enters still into the world today for, and he does it through you. Will you courageously welcome 
this courageous King Jesus into your life. And then I take it that step further. Who will you courageously talk about this courageously King, courageous King Jesus to? Let's close in prayer and song with that. Lord Jesus, we thank you for courageously coming into Jerusalem that day, triumphantly, not in failure, but with success to complete the mission that you had to show the love of God yet while we are still sinners and to die for us. Lord, there's, if there's somebody in this room today right now that needs to give their life to you, I ask them right now, Lord, do it today. Jesus came forward, and I pray that we would too. All those must confess Jesus is Lord. Ask him to save them. Just say, Lord, save me. I need a savior. Help me, Lord. Lead me in your righteous, righteousness. Be my Lord. Have authority over me and help me to walk in your ways to glorify you in all I do. And then, Lord, for those who already do trust Jesus as Lord, we pray that, that those who are trusting in you would truly define who you are to them and that we'd never be okay with some status quo. We would continue to dig deeper in our relationship each day, praying that people would come to us and would say, who is this Jesus? And as they come to us, we'd be able to say, is this Jesus? He is the one who triumphantly entered Jerusalem to be mocked, to be betrayed, to be denied, to be tortured and crucified and to die and to raise from the day the, the dead courageously, victoriously, triumphantly over our sin to save us and deliver us to his kingdom forever and to have a peace restored with God the Father. This is Jesus. Would you like to know more? Would you like to follow Jesus? Let me help you. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us your selfless, sacrificial love. Thank you for being our king, my king, my Lord of all, and having authority over me. Lord, it's, it's humbling to think of all the things you save us from. We don't understand truly how much you do save us from, but we know the past lives and the things we could be contributing our lives to or dedicating our lives to when we look around the world and see how evil and, and living in darkness it is. But you desire us to live in light in your light and you give it freely. Thank you. May we bow down at your feet and give you all the glory forever. And all God's people said, amen. Please stand and worship God. We fall down.
Thank you for praising God with me, looking to his word with me. Thank you for worshiping with me and singing these words. He is holy. May we fall at his feet today and every day. If you said any of those prayers, I pray share it with someone. If you need somebody to pray with, I pray come to me or come somebody in here. We'd love to pray with you. Give recognition to what God does. Jesus saves. Thank you. Please join us for Sunday school. And again, we have free books um, right outside the door there. Take some with you. God bless you. God bless you.